So uh, after walking with God for many years, I've been convicted to examine my life and say, am I satisfied with where I am? Are there areas of my everyday life where perhaps I've gotten a little bored with my spiritual life, gotten stagnant, uh, gotten to a place of complacency? Am I satisfied with just having a good church to go to, healthy children, financial security, you know, maybe even good family values, maybe even God's been good to me in terms of uh, being victorious in certain aspects of my life. But with other areas of my life, have I gone back to a sense of self-sufficiency and relying on my own skills and my own righteousness? Uh, Proverbs 14, verse 14 says in the living that the backslider gets bored with his life, but the godly man's life is exciting. And the reason I believe a godly man's life is exciting is because he has a continuous hunger and thirst after God. He does not he is not complacent. He is not satisfied with where he is. And the perfect example for us is Jesus, who did not uh, look at equality with God as something to be grasped, but chose to do nothing on his own initiative, but only as God led him. And we have many examples in the Gospels of where he would often slip away to be in communion with God, despite his uh, ministry. And so I want to ask myself whether I have that continuous hunger that even the most perfect person who ever lived had. Um, And so I want to ask myself these questions. Am I just as helpless as a Christian today as I was when I first gave my life to Jesus? Am I just as helpless as a husband today as the day I first, the day I got married? Am I just as helpless as a parent as the day my oldest son was born? And am I just as helpless in sharing in the church or encouraging another or prophesying as I, as I was the first time I did it? Am I, am I just as helpless in serving or am I serving out of the sense of my own fulfillment uh, out of the strength which comes from myself and not out of the strength that God provides as it says in 1 Peter 4. But my helplessness must not mean hopelessness, but it, it must translate into a complete dependence and confidence that God will meet me at my place of hunger. So I really want to have this continuous hunger in my life. In that regard, I want to share a couple of uh, passages. The first is from uh, Psalms 107, verses, uh, starting from verse 35. It says, He changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city. And as we see here, the requirement for having this pool of water and to having these springs is that I must first be a wilderness. I must be hungry. The person who's satisfied will never have this pool of water, will never have this, uh, this spring of water within him. And so I want to examine my life and say, do I, am I really hungry after the Lord? And then in contrast, in verse 40, it says, he pours contempt upon princes and makes them wander in a pathless wa- waste. And as we know, uh, there's, there's another place in the Bible where it says, uh, he's filled the hungry with good things, but he sent away the rich empty-handed. So I really want to examine myself and say, Lord, do I feel rich today in, and satisfied with where I am, or am I back to being hungry and needy? Verse 41 says, he sets the needy securely on high, away from affliction, and he makes his families like a flock. So I want to have that sense of need. But what does this mean, not just for me? As we heard, this can't just be a me prayer for myself. It has to be a we prayer. So uh, we've heard from the parable in Luke 11 of the man who asks for bread, not just for himself, but for his friends and his family. And so I want to have that same urgency to meet the spiritual need of my family and also to the brothers and sisters in the church. And as we see here, this requirement of being needy is also applicable to making my family a flock. But sometimes it's it's possible that God is not answering this prayer. And so I want to share from another passage of why maybe God is not answering this prayer of meeting the need for myself and for my family. And that's from Isaiah 58 uh, verses uh, 9 onwards, 9 through 11, Isaiah 58. And this says, you, you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. Conditionally, if you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness. And so I want to look at my own life and my home and say, am I, do I have this yoke of oppression on my home where I'm lording it over my family and not really being a servant? Is there an attitude of finger pointing under the pretext of everybody submitting to my authority? 
uh, is there, do I tolerate gossip or speaking of evil? And if that, that's the case, the Lord is not going to answer me. That's a condition for the Lord to answer me. In verse 10, it says, if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a water garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. So I see here that in order for me to really give myself to the hungry, not just to me as a hungry person, but to my family, to the brothers and sisters in the church, I really need to have this sense. I need to eliminate all finger pointing, all yoke of oppression, all speaking of wickedness. And I really need to be in this place where every day of my life, I see myself as a scorched place, as a wilderness, as dry in the absence of God and not satisfied. So I want to have that continuous uh, hunger before God, not be satisfied with the trickle, but really seek God to have that waters, uh, those waters that do not fail. Amen. Um, I'd like to share on uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, uh, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Or a different translation says, don't be fooled or don't be a fool. Bad company corrupts good character. And um, another verse says, a little leaven, this is Galatians 5, 9, a little leaven, leavens the whole lump. And um, a couple weeks ago, I was cleaning out our garden and I came across, I came across this plant here. I never knew there was actually a plant there. And as you see next to it, there's about 12 other plants. They're all the same. And um, I came to pull out the weed and the whole, um, the whole thing came out. And as I, uh, I thought to just put it back in or just throw it all away. But then I remembered the passage about the enemy sowing the weed and the tares in the wheat. And um, so I took it out and I tried to clean it up. And um, as you see there, there's a little bit of plant and the rest was weed and the root system is really big. So I took it over a, a trash can and I just started pulling the weeds out slowly. And that's all these weeds over there. And it was more of a lesson for me. I wanted to see what's going to happen. And uh, eventually I cleaned it out and that's all that's left. And the plant got damaged. I tried to save it. And um, I threw the weed away into a trash can. And so I went ahead and replanted this plant. And, it's, and it had a little bit of flowers, like the other ones had a lot. And uh, there it is with a lot of brothers and sisters that are also beautiful looking plants over there. But this one is tiny and it was planted the same day the rest were planted. And um, I thought of it that um, the lesson that I got from it is that if I allow one little weed to come through and then another one, another one, another one, and you can see they're like single root systems. They're like one, another one, another one. Eventually it just choked out the plant. And I thought of it as myself, like being, oh, if I'm that plant and, um, I allow these little sins or little things to, to come and um, take root and just slowly choke me out. On the outside, this plant is alive and it, and it has little flowers. So it's, it looks like the other brothers and sisters all around, but, but it, was, it was dying. And uh, I just related to myself, meaning like I was, <laughs> these all were planted the same day, same, they're same old, but this plant was not taken care of and so i'm entrusted like this the lord's giving me a life and uh to live and add, um to a spiritual life to to uh, be careful and to watch, be watchful and alert and if i'm not careful um in matthew uh, 13 it says that well while they were sleeping after they planted the field while they were sleeping the enemy came and planted tares and uh, if I'm not alert, those little things, little weeds, a little uh, problem, uh, evil things that I allow in my life, they can come and choke me out. Even though I look like the rest of these brothers and sisters outside and uh, got little flowers, it can still choke me out. So another thing, uh, I went there today and took a look at that plant to see how it's doing. It's been about a couple of weeks. 
and it's still there. It's struggling. It, one of the branches died from all the cleaning and it's alive. But I thought of it as that's a consequence of not being careful like the rest of these plants that were cleaned out. And this one was not being careful that allowed a lot of weeds just coming through it. A lot of um, just being not watchful. Eventually, finally, there was a awakening and this plant was cleared out, but the consequence is there. And so I thought that, well, just representative uh, for me of my own life, what it happened already several times when the Lord showed me something and uh, I finally cut it out, but then the consequence a little bit lingers on. And um, I just found it as an encouragement to me whenever I walk by this plant and I look at it and I'm like, wow, I just have to be like, the rest of those brothers and sister plants, be careful not to let any little, little sin, little temptation uh, stay or get to me, but walk in pure conscience all the time, clean out every little uh, weed that comes, sprouts up. And um, by God's grace, I believe uh, we can do this. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Last Sunday, when uh, Brother Zach mentioned a song called Will the Circle Be Unbroken? And he said that in the final days, um, there will be you know, Christian families um, holding hands. And, um, and he said, that, will there be a gap in the circle of, uh, of, of, of your family? Meaning there will be someone missing there. And I was thinking about, you know, God, God doesn't desire no one to be missing. And, and he says that in, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord, the Lord is is not slow to come, but he's patiently, patiently waiting uh, for us to repent, uh, not wishing to anyone to perish, but to all be saved. And, um, and I was just thinking that, man, I need that kind of heart, that God gives me that kind of heart to also uh, be looking out for my family. Um, I don't want any of my family to perish. I don't want any of my relatives to perish. I don't want any brothers and sisters of my church to perish. I certainly don't want to perish myself. And, um, and as I'm thinking about that, uh, the Lord just brought me again, the parable brought, brought to mind again, the parable of the prodigal son and how much the father longed day after day uh, to see his son walking back to him. Um, the father wasn't distracted you know, by anything, by any earthly things. He was just working and looking, working and looking to see if the tip of the head of the sun was going to show up on the horizon coming back to him. And it really encouraged me because, um, you know, uh, uh, it encouraged me to long and wait that and, and hope that no one in my family will perish. Um, you know, and with that, I envisioned, I envisioned myself entering into God's presence and having a great feeling of peace and, and joy, uh, you know, mixed, you know, possibly mixed with sadness because, you know, peace, because the presence of the Lord is there, but mixed with sadness and concern because there may be a circle, there may, my, my circle, my family circle may be, you know, may be broken. Um, and, but that is, but that, the, but that, but this way does not to, doesn't have to be that like that. Um, you know, I hope that God gives me a burden to, um, according to his will, to pray for my family, for my, for my relatives, you know, to those around you. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to meet the Lord and be told, you know, Arnaldo, if you had prayed just a little bit more, if you had been loving and being patient just a little bit more, if you had thought about the your, your brother's needs and your sister's needs and your church need just a little bit more, if you had hanged on to the hope that they would be saved as well, just a little bit more to the end, then they would, they would, they probably they would be not missing in your circle. And um, and God did share, God shared this with me, not not to make me sad or to condemn, but to encourage me. Um, in John nine, it says that you know uh, we have to work while the day is still on, while the light's still shining. And that I that that to never give up on praying and hoping that the circle of my family and the ones that God put around me be broken. Um, but the only way that I can sustain um, this, if it's God gives me the burden for them, feeling and hope um, to see all of them there, it will be it will fade away and will, will fade away with time. But a burden that God puts in my heart and our hearts will never go away, and it's it is always is always going to be there. Just watching and praying to see 
you know, my family and those who the Lord put around me uh, walking towards God. And this is the heart um, of our loving father, that no one will perish. But I have my part to do. I have to hope, pray, continue to do that every single day. Um, so that way, you know, my family will not have and all of us will not will not be missing in the circle. Thank you, Brother Sandy. This is a few weeks from a few weeks ago, um, but John seven thirty eight. He who believes in me from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I also wanted to um, the verse is connected closely with verse thirty seven. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said, "If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink." And he who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, rivers of living water will flow from his inmost being. So I wanted to highlight that there's there's four conditions of of the soul um, that Jesus is trying, calling out here, um, and it says in verse thirty seven that he cried it out. Um, first is if anyone is thirsty. So there's two options here. I can either be not thirsty or thirsty. Um, so similar to what Sunil shared uh, about having a hunger or a thirst. Um, the condition of me being being aware that I am lacking something um, is different. Uh, there are many people who don't aren't even aware that they're lacking something. So there's a soul here who's not thirsty and thirsty. Next, if you realize that you're thirsty or you're lacking something, uh, the next statement is, let him come to me. So I can seek after other things. I can seek after... Um, many things in this world, as Jeremiah 2.13 mentions, hewing, uh, hewing out cisterns that hold no water, uh, career, um, family, uh, beauty, uh, wealth, uh, lots of different things can distract me that, oh, if only I could have these things, uh, then I will be, then my thirst will be quenched. So first is thirsty or not thirsty. If you're thirsty, do I come to Jesus? Do I come to Jesus or do I go to other cisterns that hold no water? Next, third thing is to come to me and drink. So it's possible for the, even the believer to say, I am thirsty. I'm coming to Jesus. Wow, look at this cool, refreshing water. If, that would be so great to take a big gulp of that cool, refreshing water. Uh, how lucky are the people who get to drink from that? But you don't sit down and drink from the water. You don't enjoy uh, Christ and lean, lean in on his life in you um, and seek, uh, seek after him, seek to see him and to, um, to dwell with him and walk with him in the cool of the garden. Um, and so there's this, this fourth condition is those who realize they're thirsty, come to Christ uh, for, their, for their water, drink from the water. And then the blessing comes, he who believes in me from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So this is not, uh, I wanted to key in on this word river. So this fourth condition who have come to Christ and are uh, asking to see him and walk with him. Um, this river is not a cup or a contained source. It's not a cup or a bucket or a pond or a lake. Uh, it is uh, that has stagnant water or it will run empty at some point. It is new, fresh, clean water continuously pouring out. The second, um, second thing, it's not a creek. Um, it's not a creek that like may only satisfy me or, or those in my home. It is a river, a, a huge river that can satisfy, that can pour out and satisfy many. Uh, and third, it's not an ocean. It's not an ocean of water that doesn't quench. It is, it is clear, fresh water, uh, a river from my inmost being. Um, so I wanted to challenge, challenge, uh, I was challenged by this uh, verse, Lord, am I thirsty? Lord, am I coming to you uh, and not to other things to quench my thirst? And then am I drinking deep of the water, uh, the living water that you provide? Um, Lord, that, I may be able to be uh, have those rivers of life pouring from my inner being. Thanks. Um, John 14, 23. Uh, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. So I just want to share something which encouraged me from this uh, verse this week. And it's the word abode. 
And my understanding of that word is that abode is a place where one feels at home. And if I were to give an example, uh, let's say there's a hotel room versus my abode. Well, the hotel room could be a very nice hotel room. It could be a very fancy hotel room, even a very big one, and I could be very comfortable in it. But I would never say that I would feel at home in a hotel room. But for me, when I think of an abode, I think of my apartment here in San Mateo, where after a long day of work, I can just come home and plop on the couch and unwind and just be myself. And that is what I think of when I think of abode. And I think it's amazing to think that God the Father and Jesus Christ would be interested in my heart and my home being an abode for him, a place where they can feel completely at home. And the condition, of course, is that I must obey the Lord's commandments. And so as I thought about this, I realized I want this for myself. But what really stood out to me this week was also realizing I want this for the sake of my children. Um, as someone who's a recent, relatively recent father, I realize as a parent, um, I want the best for my kids. And so many parents in the world would do so much to make sure their kids went to the best school district, made sure they got the best piano teachers, made sure they got the best sports coaches. They put so much effort in that. And the reason is they want to have a great environment for the kids to grow up. And when I read this verse, I thought, wow, what better environment for my kids to grow up than if I could have God the Father and Jesus making a home in my particular family. And so it just challenged me to think that all the effort that people might put into finding the best school district or finding the best piano teachers, why not put that same effort into obeying God's commandments? Then my children, our children, will be blessed for, for eternity. And so that's something that really encouraged me. And I believe the Lord will help us have homes that can be abodes for him. Thank you.